Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, June 30th, 2024, our LGBTQ plus Pride and Open and Affirming Ministry Sunday is entitled The Perfectly Credible Tale of St. Marinos the Monk, or We Have Always Been Here. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, United Church of Christ, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. St. Marinas, who goes by many names, was a saint of the church who likely lived in the 5th century in that part of the Byzantine Empire we know today as Lebanon. This reflection on the life of St. Marinas grows from the seed of the saint's biography written by St. Simeon Metaphrastes in the 10th century and translated by Orthodox scholars Dimitrios Gitsames and John Senadopoulos. This account forms the backbone of our story today, including most of the dialogue. Though many have shared the details of the saint's life over the centuries in Syriac, in Coptic, in Arabic, Greek, Latin, Ethiopian, Armenian, German, French, Spanish, and now English. And the saint is honored still on the official calendars of the Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, and Catholic churches and particularly in the Maronite Catholic tradition of Lebanon. So let's listen now for a living word from God for us today in the lived word, the life of St. Marinas, the monk. There once was a man named Eugene, who together with his wife, Theodora, had an only child, whom they called Marina, believing their child to be a daughter. But the child knew better. Soon after, though, the child's mother died, and the father, he did his best to raise them in accordance with the teachings of Christ and by the example of a devout life and with the father's steadfast love. It came as a shock then when the child, having come of age, the father told them, my child, time has come to see you married to a good husband. Do not worry, for I will leave you all of my possessions. For I have no need of them, as I am departing to a monastery to tend to my soul. The child was greatly disturbed in spirit at this news, for they did not wish to take a husband or to be taken by a husband. And they feared not just for their physical welfare, but for the welfare of their own soul, forced to live a life contrary to their inmost self-knowledge, the person whom God created them to be. So for the very first time, they raised their voice to their father and wept aloud, Father, you wish to save your own soul and leave mine to be lost? Do you not know that the Lord says, the good shepherd sacrifices their life for the sheep? And elsewhere, the one who saves a soul shall be as the one who created it. I do not want to marry. I cannot. What then is to become of me? Hearing his child say such things and seeing them lamenting and crying aloud, the father said to them, my child, what can I do for you since I wish to enter a monastery? How is it possible for you to remain with me there? For the monks forsake the company of women, lest they fall into temptation. To which his child replied, No, father, I will not enter the monastery in the way that you imagine. But I will cut my hair and dress myself in men's clothing. This is how I will come with you, not as Marina, but as Marinos. For that is who I am. This is who I have always been. 
and with love, his father agreed. So while his father distributed all his possessions to the poor, Marinos cut his hair and dressed himself in men's clothing in preparation to enter the great monastery at Khanubin. Nothing had ever felt more right than the close-cropped tonsure of his head and the plain, simple robes on his body. Still, his father warned Marinos with these words, Be careful, my child, and watch yourself, for you will be passing through fire. Keep yourself pure, keep yourself grounded in the grace of Christ, that together we may fulfill our holy vows. After all, as they say, pride goeth before a fall. Together they entered the great monastery at Kanubin. It was the happiest and the scariest day of Marinas' life. There he progressed day by day in every virtue and great self-discipline. Many of the brothers thought him a eunuch, since he was beardless and had a high-pitched voice. And eunuchs were not uncommon in the Byzantine Empire in those days. Others supposed that this was the result of great self-denial. For Marinos ate only every two days. Little did they know that this extreme asceticism also had the effect of reducing his feminine features and even halting his menstruation. In time, his father died, whereupon Marinos entered even more deeply into the religious life. He added a vow of strict obedience to his self-discipline, and as a result received a spiritual gift from God, the ability with a touch of his hand to heal the infirm and cast out demons. For with Christ-like compassion, one who experiences great suffering themselves may heal great suffering in others. And one who wrestles with demons can cast them out if they dedicate themselves to that ministry. There were 40 other spiritual men living in the great monastery. And each month they took turns to go out into the world four at a time to tend to the business of the monastery in the surrounding area. The journey being lengthy, the brothers who came and went would stop to rest at an inn that lay along the route. The innkeeper attended to them and showed them gracious hospitality. One day then, the abbot called Abba Marinos, that is, Father Marinos, and said to him, My son, I am well acquainted with your entire life and your great obedience. That is, you are perfect in everything the Lord commands. Marinos winced inwardly at this, considering his great secret. Even such a compliment was complicated in his situation. The abbot continued, I have decided that you should go out in service of the monastery since the other brothers are grumbling that you have not yet taken your turn to do so. I trust that if you do this, you will receive an even greater reward from our God, who loves all persons. Hearing these words, Marinos fell at the abbot's feet and said, Give me your blessing, Father, and wherever you direct me, I shall go. Thus, when the time came for the next monthly trip, Abba Marinos went with the other three brothers on monastery business. And indeed, they did stop to rest at that inn. It happened that a certain soldier in that area had seduced the innkeeper's daughter, or worse, and she became pregnant. When she came crying to the soldier, asking what she was supposed to do now, he told her, if this becomes known to your father, if. Tell him it was that young monk from the monastery, the handsome one named Marinos, who dishonored me. With that, he tossed her a few coins for her trouble and took to the road and left. 
when, after just a few more days, her father became aware of her condition. He asked, who did this to you? And she blamed Marinos. Taking his, by now, visibly pregnant daughter by the hand, the innkeeper went straight to the great monastery and stood at the gates before God and everyone, shouting, Where is that deceiver whom they call a Christian? The gatekeeper came out to see him and asked, Why are you shouting, my brother? And he replied, I am shouting because I cursed the hour I encountered you lot. If I never see another monk again or have anything to do with you, it will be too soon. He was ushered quickly inside, out of the public eye, where he said the very same to the abbot. Holy Father, my one and only daughter, on whom I hoped to depend in my old age, will just look and see what that Marinos, whom you call a Christian, has gone and done to her. The abbot replied, what can I do for you, brother, since Marinos is not here but continues on his rounds? When he returns, however, you have my word that I will expel him from the monastery. When Abba Marinos did arrive back with the three other brothers, the abbot abraded him, saying, is this your holy conduct and your vaunted self-discipline? that while enjoying the hospitality of the innkeeper, you seduce his daughter and cause him to come here and make a scene even before the lay people? Marinos immediately dropped to his knees. This was everything he ever feared would happen. All of his secrets revealed, all the shame he had carried for so long, suddenly exposed, meaning dishonor for him and dishonor for the great monastery he loved so well. And it was all he could do just to stammer, forgive me, Father, forgive my pride for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It was unclear even to Marinos whether he was talking to the abbot or to God. Well, the abbot flared up in anger and immediately threw Marinos out of the monastery. He went out and sat in a rough grotto along the road to the monastery gate, valiantly enduring the cold and the heat. As they passed by, all those who entered and exited the monastery asked him, why are you sitting here? And he would answer, I am expelled from the monastery for the sin of fornication. When the innkeeper's daughter gave birth to a son, the innkeeper gathered up the babe and went to the monastery. Finding Marinos sitting outside the gate, he threw the baby at his feet and said, here is the product of your sin. Take it. And departed. But Marinos felt pity for the child. Taking him up in his arms, he said, as for me, I am paying for this sin. But why should this hapless child die with me? So he began to ask for milk from the local shepherds to feed the child as though he were the child's father. He fed the child, comforted him when he cried, and changed his soiled clothes. When the child grew up, having been reared with such great virtue, he was accounted worthy also of receiving holy orders as a monk himself. For three years, Marinos sat at the gate to the great monastery. When at last the brothers who had seen his great affliction and great patience and great perseverance went to the abbot and said, Marinos has been punished enough since he confesses his error before everyone who will listen. Why will you not listen? But when the abbot could not be persuaded to take Marinos back, the brothers said to him, If you do not receive him back, we also will leave the monastery. And you can sit here, an abbot with no monks. 
For how can we expect forgiveness for the sins we confess daily while Maranos has been sitting out there for three years without a single word of grace from you? Grudgingly, the abbot accepted Maranos back, telling him, I accept you back on account of the love uh, your brothers have for you, though in my eyes you are still the least of all. And Marinos prostrated himself before the abbot, saying, It is more than enough for me, Father, just to live under your roof. Thus Marinos was allowed inside the great monastery once more. But the abbot gave him the most degrading chores, which he performed with zeal, wearing himself out in the process as he continued also to care for the child who followed him everywhere, hollering and clamoring for food. One day, after some years like this, the abbot asked the brothers, Where is Brother Marinos? I have not seen him at worship for three days, though he is always the first to arrive. Go to his room and see if he has fallen ill. They went and found that Marinos had died. When they informed the abbot of this, he replied with an impious smirk, I wonder, how did this wretched soul depart? What defense could he possibly have made for his sorry life when he met our Lord at last? Grudgingly, he gave orders that Marinos's body should be prepared for burial in the cemetery at the great monastery. Well, when the brothers went to wash Marinos and prepare him for the holy rites and discovered that his anatomy was that of a woman, they all cried out in shock and disbelief, Lord, have mercy. They rushed to the abbot who asked, what has come over you? To which they replied with amazement, Brother Marinos, was a woman. Entering Marinos' room and seeing him stretched out on his little bed, the abbot's heart broke. He fell to the floor and with his face bowed to the ground, weeping and vowed aloud, this is no woman. Marinos, my brother, my son, May God do thus and so to me and more if I do not remain here at his holy feet until I die awaiting your forgiveness. It was unclear even to the abbot whether he was talking to Marinos or to God. And a voice came in response. Whether it was God or Marinos, either or both, for the life of him, the abbot couldn't be sure. And did it matter? What mattered was what he heard. If you had acted in knowledge, your sin would not be forgiven. But since you acted in ignorance, it will be forgiven you. And the abbot wept in guilt and grace at the revealed saint's feet like a little child. When at last the the abbot arose, he sent for the innkeeper and his daughter and said to him, look, Marinos has died. To which the innkeeper replied, God forgive him, but I won't. For he was the one who cast such a blight on my house. The abbot answered, no, look, again and repent for you and I have sinned against Marinos before God and the world because there is no way Marinos could have committed the sin of which we accused him truly this man was innocent when the innkeeper realized this he was abashed, and prayed aloud to God. His daughter, too, was full of remorse, as at last she told the truth of what she'd done and what had been done to her. 
It was the soldier who dishonored me and defiled me and told me to blame Marinos. And immediately their hearts were healed. And the pall of sin that had settled on their house was lifted by the light of God. Then brothers took the body of St. Marinos, anointed it tenderly with myrrh like the body of Christ, and laid it in a holy place at the heart of the great monastery with all the proper rites, praising God, the Savior of all, praising Christ, who by his life and in his body ever glorifies those who glorify God by their lives and in their bodies, who live out the holy truth given to them by their creator, who are proud of who they are becoming in Christ. So to Christ be glory unto the ages of ages. Amen. I have nothing more of my own to add to this story of the Holy One of God hidden in plain sight, like so many others in the world around us. Instead, I will close with this prayer, written in St. Marinos' honor by the members of the Friendly Fire Collective, a radical, revolutionary, leftist, Quaker collective, go figure, in 2018. And as I pray with them, will you pray with me? St. Marinos, pray for us. As your soft voice was viewed as a sign of great dedication to God, may we venerate the different ways gender shows up in our different bodies as a sign of devotion to the Christ light. May we form communities of love, support, and solidarity to leverage against oppressive religious and political figures and bring them to repentance like the brothers in your monastery did against the abbot for you. May we, through Christ's suffering and resurrection, use our own suffering to build up our chosen family just as you adopted a child even as you were ostracized. Remind us that transgender history in the church and the world is ancient and breathing still. Indeed, we have always been here. Pray for us, St. Marinos. Hmm. Maybe we have more in common with radical revolutionary leftist Quakers than we might have thought. But for now, let all who seek a bigger God, a deeper grace, a holier humanity, and a more diverse experience of Christ-like neighborhood with all creation, let us all say, Amen.